Welcome to the Practical Enneagram, it's Rez here. Peter O'Hanrahan has been teaching the Enneagram longer than I've been alive, so when he talks, I listen very carefully. If you don't know Peter, he is one of the engines behind the narrative Enneagram, the organisation established by Helen Palmer and David Daniels in the 1980s. He's been there from the beginning. He runs his own teaching, training and coaching company too at the Enneagram at work.com. Peter's an eight and he teaches like one. No nonsense, clear on the Enneagram being about emotional and body work, which is where the growth happens. The somatic characteristics that he has identified in his decades of experience, we can trust them and we can bring them into whatever body work we are currently engaged in. For example, they pair beautifully with something like Diamond Inquiry. You can find what we covered here within articles at the Enneagram at work.com. You can be taught by Peter directly during workshops he is running this autumn or fall. I believe the next one is on Enneagram and family. He's also back to teaching the narrative Enneagram curriculum in person at Menlo Park. So this is something, of course, that that is, uh, you know, has been developed over the years, <clears throat> independent of the Enneagram. But as always, when we take the map of the Enneagram and we bring it to a particular method, it empowers that method because we understand that we can adapt the adapt the, the method to different people and different type structures, different character structures. And so when we talk about the embodiment process, you know, it's really about being able to um, kind of integrate mind and body. Our culture as it's developed, as it's as mind has kind of like separated or or you know uh, become its own powerful force, uh, you know, the, the intellectual center, there's been a, a, a separation from the body and a, and a, in some ways a disassociation from the body. So mind over body, mind over nature. And so really the whole field of embodiment and somatics, um, somatics being a fancy name for, you know, working with the body, is about um, reintegrating the mind and body. My, mind, heart and body, I would say. Heart and body are really, you know, that's, that's somatic because that's all... Um, I want to say non-intellectual, but that's maybe overstating it. The point is that all three centers are part of who we are. And as we know in the Enneagram work, all three centers are uh, responsible for our type structure, right? Our type is found in all three centers. Hmm. You know, I, of course, I got into it a long time ago because that's yeah. what I needed. You know, I needed to work on my emotions and my body. And I was, you know, pretty jammed up hmm. as a young eight, type eight on the Enneagram hmm. and you know, I was carrying a lot of anger and pain and, uh, his, you know, from my earlier history. Yeah. And so um, I appreciated the, the, the counseling work and I appreciated the psychological work. And I also experienced that there was a limitation there, that it only went so far. I personally really needed to um, really work on my body, my body armor, my patterns of chronic holding and tension, um, and also my emotions, which had been pretty much suppressed during my childhood. So, so to put those together um, and not suggesting that working with the body is more important than working with the mind, but rather it's as important. And, mm. um, and I think that we need to do uh, both. Yeah, 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 okay. What does developing greater awareness of our embodiment help with specifically? There's a lot of levels to this. I mean, the first level we could say is that when we pay attention to our body center, our body, or we could say the body center of intelligence, there's a lot of important information. 
it's really very simple. I mean, it's like, well, people pay attention to their body. They know when they need to rest, when they need to be active, uh, in terms of choosing what they eat and drink. And, you know, I mean, very kind of basic daily things that most of us do to some degree. Um, but there can also be a disconnection at times or, a, or not a full connection to the body. And so being more aware of our body helps us make those kind of daily decisions. And there's also other decisions that come from the body in terms of, you know, where we live and what we do and what's healthy for us and, uh, you know, attraction to other people. And I mean, we like to think of ourselves as making decisions from our mind. You know, we're, we're thinking people, we think about things. Actually, a lot of life is lived from the instincts and the emotions. The body has a bigger role in all of this than we oftentimes pay attention to. So creating more self-awareness or more body-based awareness, we get a lot of good information. It helps us make decisions. It helps us to be healthy. And of course, if we're interested in the path of, of development and personal growth, then working with the body, starting with being aware of the body and then working with the body and the emotions, um, it's just a huge help on our path. Mm -hmm. And then we spoke briefly in, over email about how it can help with relationships too. There's a lot to say here. Uh, I know, I know. Best. I mean, you know, it's like, it's like how to be in relationship. Uh, I mean, there are three centers, right? There's the head, heart, and the body. And so head, heart, and instincts, we might say. Mm -hmm. So, um, and all those centers are uh, important. And in fact, love and connection is expressed through each of the centers a little bit differently, right? So the head center expresses love and connection through the seeing of the other person. And so that's really important because if you, you know, how can you really love somebody if you don't actually see them? So if you're in a relationship or you're in a family or you're a parent or a teacher or even just your friends, to be able to see who that person is and to recognize their potential um, and support that potential, that's kind of, you know, coming from the head center. That's love from the head center. Of course, love from the heart center is about, you know, the devotion and the compassion and the empathy. And, and, um, and we say emotional intelligence is... Uh, really such a key aspect of uh, having caring relationships with people. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's lots of ways to talk about that, whether it's personal relationships or work relationships, you know, relationships thrive on a certain level of uh, emotional rapport, emotional resonance and, and empathy so that we can actually feel something about what the other person is experiencing and feel some care and some warmth towards them. It's the feeling, the love and connection through feeling uh, and empathy. And then the body, we express our love and connection through the body center, through uh, the doing for the person that we care about, taking action on their behalf. It's really interesting to me to see how love is expressed differently in each of the three centers. And it would be great if they were all working together. Yeah. Some of us are stronger in one center than the others. But to be able to bring all three centers online in relationship is, is huge. And of course, especially in close relationships, you know, our, our bodies and our, and our hearts are, are part of it. Whether we're in touch with that or not, they ha it's just having a huge effect on uh, how we connect and how much we connect and what happens when we feel um, disconnected, you know, and how we respond, how we react. And so to be able to understand how emotions uh, work, because uh, emotions are part of the somatic process, mm -hmm. and of course our body reactions uh, and our breathing, and all of that is so central to uh, being more fully there in relationship. Mm -hmm. And also avoiding some of the, you know, the shutting down and the contractions and the, you know, there can be pain and frustration and anger in close relationships. And mm -hmm. so how do we handle all of that? And the best way to handle it is to work with all three centers, to understand how our body responds, to notice the patterns there, and to be able to kind of manage those patterns and the actions. And so we have these patterns, um, not to say that the patterns are wrong. We're human beings. We need patterns, and there are patterns in all three centers. And sometimes those patterns get us pretty locked in, and we can pay attention and, and, then, and, and work with the, the patterns on, a, mm -hmm. on a, again, emotional and physical level. One of my early teachers was Wilhelm Reich, or Reich. <clears throat> he died in, in the late 1950s, but he was really the grandfather of the somatic therapies, People don't like to talk about him much because he was kind of an eccentric, difficult guy, <laughs> counterphobic six on the Enneagram. But, but really, he was the one who, who, who said, look, 
our, our limitations are not only in our mind, they're also in our hearts and our bodies. Mm-hmm. And they show up as patterns of what he called body armor. You know, the way we hold ourselves together with chronic tension, or as we've discovered later on, uh, kind of chronic numbness. Mm. So tension, numbness, those patterns of body armor that serve to protect us and hold us together. Uh, We needed it at a certain point in our lives. Um, And yet later in life, we realize how limiting those patterns can be. Mm -hmm. I know when I was young, when I became an adult, I realized I was really shut down in my heart center. And if Mm -hmm. I wanted to have loving relationships with people, which I did, uh, I had to work on my heart center. I had to open up my heart center. I mean, people could understand this, right? This is fairly common knowledge, but we do have a way of understanding how the breathing patterns and the holding patterns uh, can show up in the body. And we also have some great methods these days for for working with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have identified in your work an Enneagram of somatic characteristics and patterns. Will we get time to which sure. three those, do you think? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, sure. There's a there's a brief way to talk about them. And I mean, the point is that if if people are interested in the Enneagram work, and mm. many people are, mm. um, generally it starts with the mind. People learn about the nine types. They they look for finding their own type and understanding these things intellectually. And if you really want to work on your type structure, you could say character structure, type structure. If you really want to work on this, you've got to work with the emotions and the body, like the emotional habits of the types, traditionally called the passions. The emotional habits are the fuel. It's running the show. I mean, if, if you know, there's only so far I can get as a type A, for example, I can know that my emotional habit is anger mm. and other ways to talk about anger but let's just say anger in general and that if i understand that intellectually that they can help me you know contain the anger or be less identified with the anger uh, try to open up other parts of who i am but uh the anger is 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 there it's like so you know what to do with that how do you work with 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 the anger at an emotional level at a physical level what do you do when the surge of, you know, that angry energy starts to show up in a big way and it starts, you know, I, I can know that now and go, okay, wait, pause, breathe, don't act that out. Um, but how do I work with getting underneath that angry energy, that angry reaction mm-hmm. to more of who I am as a human being? Mm-hmm. You know, the body types, eight, nines, and ones, the primary emotional layer is anger. Yeah. And if you can't get below that, it's like we're just like bouncing off that layer. We can't get to the deeper self, the deeper experiences. We can't get to the deeper heart. And we just, mm-hmm. it's like we go in and we hit that layer of anger. We kind of bounce off. Classic hate is like, I have feelings. I'm angry. That's my feelings. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, yeah, but there's probably more. Can I ask a question about this piece of these? Like, I still don't know the answer to this question. I'll probably never know it. But how do you get a nine in touch with their anger? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, it, look, the, the, the nines need a lot of um, support, a lot of reassurance around this, because there's something in their system that says if you get angry, you disturb the harmony, and you are going to be separated from wholeness. Nines, they, they, this is something part of their neurobiology, right? That they're, they're part, they're, they're very much attuned to harmony and how things are all part of, you know, part of the whole. And they have a, a sensitivity to that. And so if you, if you disrupt that, if you were to get angry, if you're going to say no, or I don't like that, or I, you know, that it would break, you know, it would be catastrophic. You'd break the harmony of, of, of the universe. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's not completely rational, but, but that's, often their experience. So it's scary for nines to get angry and they need a lot of reassurance. It's like we have to say to them over and over, look, it's okay. I, it's not that I like your anger necessarily, but it's not going to be the end of the relationship. Mm-hmm. And then of course, at some point the nines get angry and they don't know how to do it very well. Yeah. You know, they get angry, they might, they blow up or they feel entitled or it's like it, it's, it hasn't been integrated. And so they show up with their anger and in fact, it can be somewhat uh, destructive or mismanaged and sometimes scary for them. It's sometimes scary for us. I'm, I'm an eight. It's like when a nine blows up, it's like, 
they're not used to handling that. It's scary stuff. So mm-hmm. it takes time to, to, to integrate that, to manage that, and work with that. So it's, instead of this dichotomy between peaceful, 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 don't ever get angry. And then the, you know, okay, now I'm angry and you should give me everything I want. Mm-hmm. Um, in kind of an undeveloped, more of a childlike um, mm-hmm. experience with the anger. It's like, we've got to work with that to, to integrate that anger can be held in a larger container of, of, of harmony, actually, can be mm. part of it. Mm. But again, we have to understand that the neurobiology of each of the types is the kind of the base for the structure, the whole psychic structure. And so, you know, uh, again, uh, with nines, being able to kind of have more energy in their bodies. I mean, the interesting thing about nines, I just discovered one year as a young practitioner, I had these clients that would come in and they'd lie down on the mat, you know, and we do some deep breathing and then they promptly fall asleep. And I'm like, okay, this is not right. <laughs> I'm not earning my pay. They're kind of avoiding the work. What am I going to do here? And then I, I, and I couldn't understand it because as a type eight, that, that was so far from my experience. I mean, mm. you're, maybe you're lying down, you're partially clothed. There's this person standing over you yeah. watching everything that you do. Mm. And like, how do you fall asleep? Well, nines have a very sophisticated method which is they can breathe deeply into their bellies and that's relaxing. And then that puts them to sleep. They're good at that. Breathing into the chest, uh, not so good. Breathing into the chest is the energizing breath. It brings more energy and aliveness to the body. And of course, for nines to, to uh, practice that takes them out of their comfort zone. You're going to have more feelings because, wow. you know, we all learn as kids, if you want to not, have feelings that are unacceptable or disruptive you just hold your breath and they go away gosh that's such a useful anchor point for a nine just to notice when they're breathing into their belly and just not not doing right so, so yeah. where do you usually start when you talk it doesn't about matter it doesn't yeah. matter where do you I mean, we could let's go around the enneagram i guess yeah. so so type one mm-hmm. so here that again there's ones and eights we share something we're so different in personality but at the level of, of of the character structure we share this kind of angry response it's about things are not the way they should be and we're here to tell you how they should be it's being against things being against the way things are and so how do we work with that because in our bodies we like ones for example have this sense in their bodies of how things can fit together in the best way Mm -hmm. they just sense it like how it can come together in an organized and orderly way like the right way and then they of course they they bring it up to their head and they analyze it and they articulate that and so on but it's that understanding that that the neurobiology for ones is this um wanting things to be organized properly. It's disturbing to them if if things are disorganized or incorrect or out of place. So, you know, to be able to uh, to notice that and and breathe into that and allow it to be there and have some kindness towards oneself uh, is really fundamental to working with the time structure, right? Because otherwise you're trying to be good, right? You don't want to really get angry because that's not nice. So you're kind of clamping mm-hmm. your jaw shut. You're holding your shoulders and you're holding your breath. You know, you can try to control yourself <laughs> so you're good. And, you know, it, that's how to say, I mean, it's admirable. And yet at the same time, it doesn't actually shift the type structure in any kind of fundamental way. You've got to get to the anger, release the anger in a way that doesn't harm anybody or anybody else and get underneath the anger. And then mm-hmm. work with noticing that reactivity that shows up. Right? Mm-hmm. That's not right. Or you didn't do that right. Or you should do this better. Or we should, you know, there's some really wonderful energy in that for ones. Uh, yeah. But as we know, any qualities of the type when they're overdone can become a big problem. So I know as you were even talking about the one then, you were doing lots of sort of like rigidy stuff with your bodies. So ones probably do, I'm imagining of all the types, hold a lot of physical tension. Yeah, there's different patterns of tension. Mm-hmm. Again, general patterns. It's not like everybody has to fit the description, but there are general patterns. And for ones, the lower body tends to be fairly expressive. For ones are their body type. So they got a good charge of energy down in the in the mm-hmm. in the instinctual center. But there's this top-down control. And so the jaw gets tight, the shoulders get tight. Uh, sometimes the, the diaphragm gets tight. Neck, mm-hmm. yeah, it's kind of like jaw, neck, and shoulders mm-hmm. is where they hold most of their tension. 
And I eights, you know, eight the neurobiology of eights, <clears throat> there's this access to a lot of physical energy mm -hmm. quickly. Helen Palmer once said, um, I appreciated this. She said, there's very little internal resistance. You know, mm -hmm. the energy comes up, it comes forward, it's good, you're enthusiastic, you want to get things done, you want to connect with people, and it, it can be too much. It can be overdone. You know, it's like, so for AIDS to be able to recognize that there are a lot of ways to work with this big energy that can be much more effective and, and also a lot healthier in the, in the long run because it's, it can be too much for us over time. Mm. <laughs> we hear it from other people. You're, like, you're coming on too strong. You know? like, yeah. Count it down a little bit. It's like, it's like, you just want me to suppress myself. Well, <laughs> actually, no, it's a little different than that. It's about containing and it takes practice yeah subtle skill but eight we can learn to do this and then nines we've sort of covered anything else you, you would say about nines and somatic characteristics well again it's just about being in the comfort zone and mm. um, avoiding carrying any more charge in the body than yeah. you absolutely need to mm -hmm. so for example a nine could be uh, very athletic and they would could run a lot of physical energy but and and breath but it's it it's going to be discharged at the same time you know what i mean they said they're not going to just walk around with more energy in their bodies you know mm -hmm. um and that's the challenge for nines is to slowly one step at a time you know develop more room for holding carrying more energy in the body mm -hmm. problem is of course you're going to have more feelings you're going to have some discomfort and that needs to be worked with too. Okay. So should we move well, to the heart types next? Heart types. Well, you know, in general, the heart types are looking for the connection, the approval, the recognition in the field of relationship. But we all are to some degree, but for the feeling types, it's like, that's where you live. That's what gives meaning. That's what you're looking for. If yeah. there's a disruption in the relational field, it's a big deal. Hmm. And that's true for twos, threes, and fours. And, you know, attention goes out to how am I being received? What's my approval rating? Are people responding to me? Um, and there's if three different strategies, of course, for getting that approval and recognition. The twos are very clear. You know, twos have what's called more mirror neurons. We have these neurons and neural pathways in our bodies that can actually duplicate or recreate somebody else's experience in our bodies. Like our, we're, res, we're responsive as human beings to what's going on with other people, all of us to some degree. But twos are they're born with a huge amount of responsiveness because of their neural uh, pathways and their mirror neurons. And so they're so responsive that it's hard for them to not be responsive. And of course, if they got to get a lot of reinforcement for that, you know, yeah, you know, we appreciate your helping and tuning in and, you know, being responsive to us, then they tend to um, get imbalanced. With threes, it's, all, it's somewhat similar. You know, threes, of course, they're still looking outside themselves for validation and recognition. And uh, again, making that inward turn, coming inside, which is challenging for threes because there's so much to do and there's so much activity. They're built for action. Threes are mm. built for action, mm. right? They're responsive to the expectations of other people. And they're also uh, have a high amount of kind of kinetic energy. They want to move and do and be active. And so you've got the responsiveness, you've got the being active and, and, uh, and that's all wonderful, except when of course it gets over done, too much. Yeah. It's hard to slow down, hard to relax. Mm. Right, to get there in a relationship and breathe into the heart and actually be present. They, they really are feeling types. It's just they, there's this layer on over the chest, a kind of layer of holding. And you get underneath that layer of holding and all of a sudden there's all kinds of uh, feelings going on. Yeah. Like there, there are these signals from the body. Um, mm. For each of the nine types, there's, there's a set of signals that if you can you know, know those signals and tune into those signals, it's really useful. Yeah. Uh, for example, with threes, is that kind of rush of forward momentum. And again, nothing wrong with that, except when you're kind of caught in that. And yeah. it becomes a habit and a pattern. And then you end up at some point realizing, wow, I'm being kind of driven. 
Mm. And they can really burn out that way, can't they, if they carry on? They can burn out that way, yeah. yeah. And then the fours are an odd one, aren't they, with this? Well, the fours are a receptive feeling type. Mm. The twos and threes, attention goes out. It's active, you know. Fours are different in being receptive. Experience, you know, I'm married to a four. I mean, Mm. just like standing and watching a beautiful sunset. I mean, (laughs) for the eight, it's like, oh, great sunset. Sure. (laughs) Whereas the four is like, wow, this is so moving. There's like, they're affected. They're taking it in. And I'm like, hmm, I want more of that, whatever that is, you know, because, you know what I'm saying? So the fours have a lot of, lot to teach us about receptivity. Mm-hmm. The problem, of course, is that it's like having boundaries to, to hold and protect that receptivity. We don't make our boundaries consciously. We make them unconsciously. And so, mm-hmm. you know, that's not so great. So the fours will have boundaries, but it's like, you know, well, this isn't good enough, or I can't connect with those people, or, I, it's not, I, you know, instead of just like, okay, I need to find a boundary so that I'm not being taking things in all the time, particularly things that aren't good for me. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, again, it's, it's body-based. And you can know that in your head. But emotionally and physically, you have to practice uh, mm. making a, a you know a boundary, a, mm-hmm. a friendly boundary. We hope. Is there anything to say about the breath of these type, the breathing of these types? Um, I don't breathe well, and I hold my breath a lot, and all sorts of dodgy things I'm doing. Yeah, the feeling types generally breathe more high up in the body. Yeah. It's hard to get down to the belly. It, it's a hysterical pattern. Excuse yeah. my bad language. Yeah. I mean, you know. Psychology in the field of psychology has a lot to say about this. It's like instead of being able to to kind of contain and uh, ground the energy, mm-hmm. it tends to kind of spill out into the environment yeah. different ways. The threes are like, I got to make things happen, and the twos is like, oh, I got to connect and help you, and the fours it's like it spills out into kind of an emotional drama, or mm-hmm. then they retract. So fours ha- can like you know kind of spill out, but then they can also retract mm-hmm. yeah. and. Uh, hold their breath, lower their energy level as a way mm. to protect themselves. Yeah, yeah, and collapse. Oh. You okay? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm holding it together. Let's move to head types. And the head types, I mean, this is the classic, you know, kind of integrating mind and body. We talked about that earlier. That's It's true for all of us to some degree, but especially for the head types. And so how to, it, because the energy tends to rise and collect mm. in the head center. Mm-hmm. And uh, because that's the lead center of intelligence, and the emotional primary emotional layer is fear. Not because they're necessarily in touch with their fear, but actually that's a very important step. You know, mm-hmm. like even the seventh, it's like you know, what's so hard? What's so scary about going inside yourself? You know, and breathing down and s- slowing down the mind and having your feelings. It's like that's where sevens can get pretty anxious. The five, six, and seven to get to the layer of fear and then get underneath that. When when they can do that, it, it, I mean, it's very courageous and, and uh, awesome when when five, six, and seven are willing to, to connect with their fear, work with it, and then get underneath it where they can become more in touch with their heart center, their body center, when so much of them comes online other than just the, the head. It's true that 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 five, six, and seven, they can be very strong in their bodies and they can kind of uh, participate in sports and yoga and martial mm-hmm. arts. And, and so the direction, but the mind is directing the body mm-hmm. just to hang out in the body. Mm, not so easy. They want to control mm-hmm. the body, you know, with the mind. So to let go of the control and just let the body have its own life. And of course, fives, you know, their neurobiology they're so sensitive in their nervous system. It may not look like that because if that sensitivity has not been respected over a long period of time, they go up into their heads. They leave their bodies. They get very detached. That's their defense because to be in the body, in such a sensitive body, is can be scary and overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Like too much noise, too many people, uh, the wrong kind of food, or whatever. I mean, warmth, cold, I mean, they really have highly sensitive nervous systems. And we, oftentimes we don't understand that because, again, they, they've, they've protected themselves by going up into their heads and being very detached. It's like, whoa, you're not in your body. Well, you know, how could they be supported? What are the methods? What, 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 what kind of understanding could help them 
be in their bodies, not just in an active way, because a lot of fires can be active in their bodies, but in a receptive way. Um, the sixes are complicated, as we know. Uh, I say that with some warmth and appreciation. You know, it's like they're just complicated, you know. They, to understand sexes, we have to get that they have the most easily triggered alarm system, all the types. It's in their neurobiology. They're born this way. It's not a neurotic problem. It's an existential problem. For sexes, this alarm system has had enormous survival value for not only them, but for the family and the tribe and the group and the, because they are more quickly triggered into a fight, flight, or freeze response. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We all have that to some degree, but the six is the danger or the possible danger, uh, they pick up, you know, mm -hmm. way quicker than anybody else. And, and of course, in the modern world, there's so much going on all the time that the sixes can can kind of get somewhat triggered a lot of the time. They're like they could be at least like a little alarmed. So it's not easy to relax, to get back to the kind of neutral. And that's such big work for six because unless you can manage that, how far can you get in terms of working on yourself? I mean, you know, you can be phenomenally uh, uh, brilliant and, and smart in your mind and, and, and be able to to you know, understand things and develop theories and psychologies. And, and I mean, it's, you know, it's so much great material that comes from, you know, the head types. But to, to be able to access the heart and the body and welcome the intelligence of those centers and the experience of those centers and how much of life is lived from those centers, you got to deal with this highly sensitive alarm system. And it seems like they've got more of a task on their hands, these head types, as you're talking. The other types have at least one, I don't know, leg in the realm of embodiment. Like their other body in terms of embodiment, yeah, yeah, you're probably right. Now, it, I mean, we can be biased in our embodiment. It's not like we're always doing it clearly in, health, in a healthy way. But, but yes, there's somewhat more energy available in the heart center, the body center. Um, whereas the head types, again, that tendency to go up into the mind, um, because the mind is so strong and familiar and mm. important, um, you know, we use our strengths to, to, to protect ourselves. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so sevens, this is, I mean, they are just faster than most other <laughs> bears you know what i mean your average bear or average human being. i mean they're just so quick their minds are so quick so creative and move so fast in different directions and you know they have this capacity for lots of stimulation it's almost like not only intellectual stimulation but also physical stimulation you know and and at the same time they can overdo it because you know i like with the eights we say well if something is good more is better so why not? I mean, this, this, at some point, it's too much stimulation. And so what happens is that energy moves to the periphery of the body. And it's hard for them to collect energy and attention in, in the center of their bodies. Mm -hmm. Again, that's the opposite of fun. Yeah. Uh, it's because it's biased and to pull it way in to the middle of their bodies. And then seven, but sevens kind of, you know, overdo it in terms of the periphery. If you're overstimulated, um, and you're not able to actually digest experience or feel it more inside, there's a tendency to kind of just keep it going. And the more you yeah. keep it going, you can actually desensitize yourself, including eights in this too. We can desensitize ourselves. So we have to have more in order to experience the same amount of sensation or feeling or whatever it is, a pleasure before. So it's like more. And over time, the body becomes desensitized. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. So anyway, seven, so... Uh, they're so great, um, but they they really <laughs> like to get down in and down. You know, we say in and down. Bring the attention down, down to the heart, down to the belly, down to the feet, um, and uh, that's just a really important work for sevens. You know, the instinct priorities, Peter, and whatever's emphasised and then whatever's neglected. Does that tend to create somatic patterns as well, or not so much? Um, say that again for me. To, to preservation types tend to have certain holding patterns, social types and sexual types. 
You know, it's, it, it, it's an interesting question because a colleague of mine raised it. I mean, I don't know. I mean, there are things we could talk about about the different instinctual subtypes, but I'm not sure it's quite the same. I mean, I, I, I know that I can describe what I've learned about the somatic patterns of each of the nine types. Yeah. When we come to the instinctual subtypes, I don't know about yeah. that. Yeah. We yeah. can talk about their focus of attention. Yeah. We can talk about what's important to them. Uh, we know that, for example, that self-preservation people tend to disperse their energy. Socials mm. tend to kind of control the, their energy. Mm. Uh, one-to-ones tend to kind of, you know, kind of become kind of very bright and intense with their mm-hmm. energy. Um, so there's so there's that. Self-pres disperses. Can you say more about that? Mm-hmm. Well, I don't want to overcommit, so to speak. I mean, there's just a tendency for self-preservation people to, um, it's like the doing of things to take care of the self-preservation. Yeah, okay, concern. I see. So they're, yeah, they're yeah. a little fussy around it, yes, you know, yes. and there's always something that they can do to become more secure or comfortable or more, and, there's, and there can be an overdoing at times. Um, yeah. It makes a lot of sense. And from a social subtype point yeah. of view, it's kind of like, uh, hello, like quit <laughs> flitting around here, there. And the, I mean, it's like, like, let's, it seems unfocused to a social because we want things to be focused in a certain way that meets our needs for social organization, <laughs> social contact, social roles, social meaning. And how come you're just like, you know, running off to the store to get more this, that, and the other? <laughs> Oh, that's really funny. Oh, well, are you a social type, by the way, Peter? I don't know. I'm a social, yeah. You are, I'm yeah. A <laughs> social type. Um, and those one to ones, it's like, okay, just how intense do you want to get? And how long can you keep it up? And it's like, you know, we say for the one to ones of any Enneagram type, energy management, because it's just, they get so intense. It's like, yes. I think you answered the the other question I had, which was around actually breath work. I kind of want to ask a nosy question now. What what irritates you the most about the way the Enneagram's going now, if anything? Hmm. I don't need to say feel free not to answer because you're an eight. You won't answer. Right, I, well, well, that's a good reminder to me. I have to monitor a little bit. I don't want to be, you know, that's my tendency. It's like, yeah, those people, what do they know about the Enneagram? All right, yeah. But I don't know what it, I guess, I guess what what bothers me is when it's all from the head. Mm. And there is a a disinterest or an avoidance of working with the heart and the body. Mm. Then I, then my feeling is it's incomplete. It's like, we need to do the work, right? We need to work on ourselves. The Enneagram develops through working with ourselves, working with other people people's lived experiences. And so we have to be a little careful about all these ideas about it's this way, that way, and the other way. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, it, it, I mean, that's fascinating, I realize. But but really, I think we have to ground it into pe- in people's lived experience. And so I get a little impatient with people who are maybe new, newer to the Enneagram, and they've got all these ideas. And, you know, take some time to, to work with it and, you know, See if you can develop all three centers. That's the holistic model. It's also mm-hmm. Gurdjieff's model, by the way. Yeah. I mean, Gurdjieff was talking about the fourth way, you know, meaning not just working with the body or the heart or the or the or the mind, working with all three centers, right? And um, so I'm mm-hmm. a big proponent of that. Mm-hmm. Are there, is there anything progressive that you see about the way the enneagrams going or not? I think there's some just wonderful work that's happening. Um, again, the map of the Enneagram combined yeah. with other methods of human mm. development. Um, there's a book out uh, called Recovery Now uh, by a couple of uh, colleagues. It's about yeah. working with trauma, using mm-hmm. the Enneagram to support and empower the work with trauma by understanding different type structures and how people respond to trauma and how they hold trauma, which of course is influenced by our Enneagram type. Another colleague, Ginger Labid Bogda, I mean, she, who's been so much on the forefront of the, you know, working with the Enneagram in business and organizations. Mm-hmm. And she's got a number of great books and her recent book is about the Enneagram in teams. It's brilliant. 
it's just so clear because she has the background. She's got the 40 or 50 years of working with teams and organizational development and knowing the Enneagram. And, and I don't mean to leave anybody out. I think there's a lot of people who are not just the people who write the books, yeah. uh, but also people who are developing um, ways of working with uh, psychotherapy and coaching and mm. uh, spiritual direction. And um, there's mm. so much good work happening with the Enneagram. Yeah. Um, what, else? what are you most interested in? Is there a learning edge that you have or an area that you feel like that gets your attention more? Well, you know, there's a saying, if you really want to learn something, uh, you know, try to teach it. I find myself continually challenged in terms of my teaching and my mm. articulation and what's the best way to talk about this. And I think one of the major things that um, has been important for me, and I think other people too, um, is that over time we have uh, learned not just to use the Enneagram as a critical view of human beings, but also as a, an appreciative view that we, the Enneagram helps us to celebrate the diversity in the human community. It's mm -hmm. not all about neurosis. It's not all about being mm -hmm. asleep. It's not all about sin, you know, or whatever, you know. I mean, again, all of the traditions have a lot of wonderful information in them. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't want to be disrespectful, but it got it, it was kind of heavy in the in the beginning years. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, you you know, your ego was 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 bad uh, because it was an impediment to your spiritual development, or you know, you're always going to be neurotic because this and that. And and I think once we had children, um, everything shifted. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, are we going to tell the kids that your personality sucks? No, that would be We're a hard thing to do. You're beautiful and wonderful. Yeah. yeah. That's true. Thank you so much for your, for your time. Well, thank you, Rez. Thanks for your enthusiasm for the Enneagram. And we do have a lot of enthusiasm, I'll say that. Next time, I'll be speaking to Deborah Uton on the spiral, spiral dynamics.